Uh, we are going to be covering entrepreneurship and small business. Entrepreneurship and small business management. And today's topic is actually something that's often not covered in these classes, which is other approaches to being an entrepreneur, namely franchising and buying a working business. Buying a working business. So the first thing we want to talk about is kind of the franchise model. So the franchise model is pretty straightforward and it'll have caveats depending on which franchise you work with. But essentially, there's a large company, right, big company involved in marketing, working with your suppliers, everything else. And they handle all of those pieces. And what they do is they allow you to leverage all of these pieces by opening your own store or retail location um, and in exchange they take away some control so you have to sell certain products you have to behave a certain way you have to keep up with certain standards however the profits of the business after you've paid them all their fees are yours so the good thing here is you're really not starting a business from scratch right so you're not starting a business from scratch you're reducing your risk, right? You're reducing your risk by a huge amount. And you have the opportunity to kind of dip your toes into running a business. Dip your toes into running a business, right? So franchising can be a great way to, one, get into owning your own business. And two, if you don't really have a good business idea, but you see a need in your community that's available through a franchise, this can be a great way to already have a nationally recognized name and jump right in and do that, right? So that's the franchise model, right? In the franchise model, we'll be referring to the franchisor, franchisor, and the franchisee. Right? The franchisor is the big company that sells, sells franchises, right? Sells franchises. They're the big company that does that. Whereas... The other one is the franchisee, which is actually founds the franchise, founds and runs franchise, right? So here's the thing. It's important to look at this class in, in the way that it's taught from the perspective of the franchisee because, you know, most likely or more often than not, this will be the shoes that you're in if you're in the franchise business. However, you could also be a franchisor, right? And, you know, consider that from, from that perspective, you have an opportunity uh, to go ahead and open a franchise of your own or, or start a company that allows other people to open franchises, okay, if there's some, some kind of deep innovation or something like that that you have. So a good example of that and something that I haven't seen yet but I'm sure exists is, you know, people constantly need help with plumbing and stuff like that. And there's not really... As far as I know, an app that you can get on and say, I need a plumbing job, right? I need plumbing. So if you started a company that makes this app that says, I need plumbing, um, and you're able to get it in all 50 states, right? So everybody is just contacting you directly. And then you delegate that work. Rather than delegating it to only companies you own, you allow certain contractors to become franchisers right? And for that, you set their rates, or you set their availability, or you provide them with the tools or with the connections, and you're able to lower the costs of the actual plumbing. Oh, looks like I pulled there. Yeah, I did move the camera. My bad. My bad. Ah, there you go. Okay, so you start this I Need Plumbing app, right? And everybody from 50 states is sending you plumbing jobs. Okay, and you are sending them out to your franchisers. Now, you can restrict your franchisers on their geographic area so that there's only one of them per geographic area, depending on the workload, right? You can set their rates. You can set their quality of service. You can set just about everything 
stagnant in order or in exchange for receiving this constant stream of customers. And people would be interested in this if you became a trusted name. So let's say you were Plumbers & Co., right? And everybody knew that Plumbers & Co. does the best reliable plumbing. They usually have the best price. Um, and they come with like a 60-day service guarantee, right? Service comes with a 60-day service guarantee. So if anything goes wrong, they'll come back and fix it for free. And on top of that, they usually respond within 24 hours, right? So you can guarantee these things because you can enforce them on your franchisors and someone could lose their franchise license if they fail to live up to these expectations, right? So when you're thinking about this class from the perspective of a franchisee, also remember to think about it as a franchisor, right? That you could go ahead and start a franchise yourself. So from that point on, right, we look at something, uh, we look at different types of franchises, right? So there's a product and trade name franchise. Product and trade name franchise. Right. So what that means is, for example, Coca-Cola is distributed around the world. However, Coca-Cola doesn't have plants all around the world. Instead, they franchise Coca-Cola bottling to different factories. And these factories have to pass a series of inspections. They have to pay a litany of fees and so on and so forth. But in exchange, they get this huge volume of Coca-Cola business. Right? Which you can imagine if you open a factory and you're making some niche drink, having a huge amount of business from Coca-Cola allows you to sustain operations on a regular basis and then deal with other clients and customers. Right? There's also business format franchising. And business format is what we usually see with fast food chains. That's your Subways, your McDonald's, your Burger Kings, your Wendy's. All of those are business format franchises. So the person goes out, they get their own location, usually approved by the company, and they get everything. They get the construction, they get the food, they get the machines, they get the processes, they get the billing systems, the POS systems, everything from the same franchisor, right? They get everything from McDonald's, they get everything from Burger King, and simply they pay Burger King for the fees and the materials, and then they collect the profits that they receive. Sometimes the profits are on a split, um... But that's a business format franchise. There's also a thing called piggyback franchising. Um, and piggyback franchising is actually very interesting. I'm sure many of you have seen it. But piggyback franchising basically allows you to join up with another company. So, for example, if you've ever seen a Starbucks inside a Walmart or um, a Dunkin' Donuts inside a Walmart or... Any kind of merging of businesses or a 7-Eleven that's part of a gas station, right? The 7-Eleven doesn't own the gas station. They're just franchised as part of the gas station, right? So that's piggyback, right? So you're part of a larger, part of a larger independent, independent company. But what you're doing, and which is very reliable, is if people are walking around Walmart and getting thirsty and getting tired, they want to buy coffee. And if you're the coffee shop that's inside the Walmart, you're going to get a lot of business without having to advertise your location. So nobody's going to run into the Walmart and buy coffee. They may, but for the most part, people walking around in the Walmart may buy it, right? So that's piggyback. And then finally, we have co-branding. Co-branding is what you've seen a lot of American companies do, actually. And this is where two companies will start having a franchise where the two companies are joined, right? So basically, you could have a KFC and something else under one roof. Or you can have a Baskin-Robbins, um, and I forget the company they, they merged with, but... Oh, Dunkin' Donuts, right? So you could have Baskin-Robbins and Dunkin' Donuts under one roof. And the reason is, they're usually complementary goods, right? Sometimes they have inverse seasonality. So for example, Dunkin' Donuts has to have ice machines, right? Because they offer iced coffee all year round, right? How many people buy iced coffee in the winter? Not many, but you can use those ice machines in the production of ice cream and lattes and all that kind of stuff at Baskin Robbins, right? So the thing is, people predominantly, right, if they're going, if they're already going to a Dunkin' Donuts, they're looking to buy coffee, usually, and donuts, right? And donuts and ice cream are not that far apart, so 
Sometimes people will want ice cream, sometimes people will want donuts, but usually companies will see that working together, working together, gives them a situation where one plus one is greater than two, right? So they're able to make more money by being close together, and rather than buying two retail locations, they're able to squeeze two stores into one retail location, right? AWP is another famous example of that, but there's there's quite a few of these that have propped up over time, and sometimes they actually end up just merging into one company. Um, so franchises are usually going to be owned not by independent owners, but by area owners, right? Area owners. So what they'll do is they'll actually, they'll go to someone like McDonald's, right? And they'll say, okay, so, you know, this is, this is kind of, let's say this is all of, all of Queens, New York, right? Um, and we are willing to commit to opening 30 stores over the next five years. Okay, no problem. So McDonald's says, okay, no problem. Here's what we'll do for you. There's enough customers to sustain 30 stores over here. So what we'll do is we won't sell anyone a franchise license in this area for the next five years while you open your 30 stores, right? And so what happens is this area owner will saturate this entire area with McDonald's So that, no one else can get into that area, right? So any McDonald's you go to in that area actually belongs to the same corporation that just mass franchises from McDonald's, right? Another famous operation like that is Yum Brands, right? So Yum Brands, um, Yum Brands owns, they own Pizza Hut, they own, I'm spacing on the names now, but they own, they own a couple of different fast food restaurants. Um, and they are owned in turn by Pepsi, um, and they distribute only Pepsi. But they own Pizza Hut, they own a wing place, they own a couple of other fast food places. And so what will usually happen is one company will come in and say, okay, well, we'd like to set up five Pizza Huts, three wing places, five ice cream places, and one burger place, right? And we'd like to set them all up in this area. And they'll section off that area just for those restaurants, Right, so that no one is competing with you in that area. Now, these are the big franchises. Not all franchises are as big as Yum Brands or McDonald's or anything like that, but they are proof that this is a superior way of scaling a good business model. Right, this is because one, you're relying on outside financing. Two, owner operators or corporation operators are more invested in the business than if you just hire managers. Right, so if I open a thousand stores and I hire managers. Unless I'm giving those managers a percentage of the profits, they're not going to be very motivated to see that store succeed, whereas an owner is very motivated. So what are the pros of franchising, right? So the pros of franchising is that you have a higher probability of success, right? And the reason is pretty simple. Have you heard of McDonald's? Yes, right? And that's it. Have you heard of uh, McDaniels? No, you've never heard of McDaniels. So if you open a McDaniels, you're going to have a hard time getting people to know it and come to it, right? So your probability of success is higher. <clears throat> now, a part of this result isn't actually only the marketing and everything else. It's the fact that a lot of these franchises are very selective. So, for example, to open a Baskin-Robbins, you need to demonstrate that you have $300,000 in assets in your name before you can even open it. So they don't let just anyone do it. And usually people that have experience in business and are opening these franchises and have some money put away, tend to be more successful because this isn't kind of their first rodeo, right? You have ingrained marketing, right? Which means not only is there established trademarks and names and everything else that are common in the public eye and visible in the public eye, but also your campaigns are going to be generated by the corporate office. It means you're not worrying about how you're going to do marketing. You're not worrying about hiring people to do it. You're not worried about any of that. The third thing is economies of scale, right? So, for example, if you were to open a McDaniels, which is a burger shop that competes with McDonald's, you would have to go out and buy beef. Your price of beef is going to be very different than McDonald's. And the reason is McDonald's is, open, is able to buy in massive bulk at a time, right? They're able to commit to their farms. They're able to commit to their suppliers and say, we're going to buy 10,000 pounds of beef a day right? And I think the actual number is actually slightly higher than that. 
but 10,000 pounds of beef a day, right? And when you commit to that kind of number, your farmers can also scale their operations to produce 10,000 pounds of beef a day. Now, that's not always good for the cows, but that's a different story. And one of the things that you should consider in terms of your own involvement in franchises is a lot of these franchises are based on cost cutting. And if cost cutting and ethics is something that you're worried about when opening up a franchise, you should look for that. The next thing is reduced purchasing costs, which we covered. Assistance obtaining capital. Assistance obtaining capital. And operations. So it can cost upwards of a million dollars to open up a McDonald's, right? We're talking about the land. We're talking about the structure, the machines, hiring the employees, training the employees, running all of the equipment, having all the food, advertising, having your people there, the franchise fees. All of that requires capital. Now, if you go to a bank and you say, I want to open a McDaniels, they're going to say, okay, well, that's great. What's your plan? Well, I want to open one store and I haven't really figured much out. They're going to say, okay, well, come back when you figured out a lot more. Maybe open a smaller store and see if that works. However, when you come to the bank and you say, I want to open a McDonald's, a McDonald's says, hey, we can verify this guy is going to open it. This is going to be the predicted amounts of sales. This is going to be the seasonality of the turnover. This is how much they should be making if everything is running on time, right? The bank is much more lenient on lending money to you, right? Which means you can jump into a much larger business opportunity without actually having all of the backing that you need and instead getting it from McDonald's. The other piece of it is your operations, right? So if you've never run a business, especially a fast food business, you may not know how to handle operations. You may not know how to settle cash at the end of the day. You may not know how to make sure inventory is sufficient. You may not know what kind of licensing you need, how long something can be on the shelf before it tastes bad. All of that kind of stuff you have to figure out, right? How long to cook something, how to form patties, all of that, right? So rather than figuring that out, they basically come in a box. Your operations come in a box because McDonald's requires you to follow their operational model. Why? Because McDonald's is a franchise that prides itself on delivering the same customer value and the same customer experience regardless of where you are on the planet. right? And then finally, what you'll get from a good franchise is management support. right? And this is something where your franchisee, if, if your agreement is correct if your franchise if the franchisor is ethical and if you have good incentives for both your side and their side the management what did i write propose management support the management support is very valuable and the reason the management support is very valuable because you're going to run into issues and if you run into issues within a franchise if you run into issues within your own business you could maybe go to the small business bureau or you could maybe go talk to other people that have opened burger shops and ask them how they dealt with it right however if you run into an issue running a mcdonald's you go to mcdonald's and they literally oversee other people running thousands and thousands of mcdonald's worldwide and so they have a huge repository of information to go ahead and tell you hey this is how you run a McDonald's, and this is the right way to do it. So that's on the pros, right? There's also some cons to franchising. It's not all, all rainbows, right? Um, one of the cons is misleading earnings, right? So not all franchises are McDonald's. Some franchises are ripoffs, right? So they'll tell you, yeah, well, most of our stores make millions of dollars. Okay, that's great. Um, however, how is my store going to do? Well, you could make millions of dollars. Okay, so you get into this franchise and then you're not making anywhere close to that. You're going to be pretty upset, right? So that's a problem with franchising. Unfair product dealings, right? So unfair product dealings is the following, right? So McDonald's product dealings. McDonald's does the following, right? McDonald's will buy beef. They'll truck it to where it needs to go or hire the trucking company to where it needs to go, right? So there's the cost, the cost, the product cost and the shipping cost, right? So there's these two costs, right? 
And so they'll tell you, okay, well, your total for the beef is your percentage of everything that we did this year, right? So for example, it's like one, you know, out of, out of 50,000 stores, assuming your store does a small amount of volume, right? So that's what you're going to pay. Some other companies will do the following. Some other companies will, will go to the farm. Okay, so this is a farm. I don't actually know how farms look. This is a farm and this is a cow. Okay, this is a cow. That's a cow. Okay, they'll go to the farm and they'll buy the beef. Okay, they'll buy the beef. But they won't buy it themselves. They'll buy it with a subsidiary that's owned by the company. So the subsidiary will buy the beef. Then what they'll do is they'll mark it up, right? They'll say, well, add 20% to the cost. And then force you as a franchisee to buy from that subsidiary only, which means you could get a better price on the market for the beef than you are from your franchisor, right? And that's a major problem. That's really a major problem. Because it's another way that they can take advantage of you, right? Let me see if there are any questions. Pros and cons can be dictated, negotiated by franchise agreement. Absolutely. Absolutely. So a lot of your pros and cons are going... So this is one of the benefits of the cons in a franchise environment. Is that they are negotiable. And usually transparent. Right. So if you know what to look for, you can find it. Right. And this is a very important thing. If you know what you're looking for and you can find it, that's very, very useful to you. Right. So the next thing is encroachment. Right. Encroachment. And I'm sure you've all heard that word before. But what encroachment means in a franchise situation is the following. Let's say the franchise. So let's say you're on. Say this is Main Street, right? And this is Northern, right? In Flushing, these are these are pretty big streets uh, in terms of foot traffic and car traffic, right? Like the train is not too far and all that stuff. So in New York, this is a pretty big deal. Um, let's say your McDonald's is located right over here and you're doing an insane amount of sales. And McDonald's looks at your sales and says, well, this is kind of problematic, right? This is kind of problematic because, I mean, what do we do about this? right? We, we, I mean, we want to be making all that money, not them. So McDonald's goes ahead and opens a store across the street from you. right? That's not going to make you very happy, especially if it's a bigger, nicer, fancier store, and they start putting you out of business. right? McDonald's would never do that, hopefully, but some franchises will. And that's something else to watch out for. So make sure that it, in your contract, it's protected. And finally, the biggest issue with franchises is inherent in the process, in that it is limiting. You don't have full control of your business, right? As a matter of fact, usually the more successful the franchise, the more control you have to give up, right? And this means something like territory, hours, Right? So they can force you to be in a specific location and say you can't leave that location, you can't change locations, you can't move into a different location. Right? You have to have certain hours. Right? So you have to be open 24 hours, for example. That's it. That's just what it has to be. There's no other way for you to get around it. Right? You don't get to do your own advertising. Right? If they want to price McChickens at 50 cents, they're going to price McChickens at 50 cents. If they want you giving away Happy Meals for free, you're giving away Happy Meals for free. No ifs or buts about it. Right? Goods and services, right? So in the case of McDonald's, you can't you can't just go selling lighters or chips at McDonald's. You can't just go and say, okay, well now we're selling chips too. Um, you can't do that, right? You can't just sell crackers or you can't sell stuff that's not on the menu, right? Um, and then finally. This all limits or could limit your potential for new customers, right? So in the McDonald's case, they actually tend to be not flexible, but understanding of, of different things that need to be done. And they, they'd like you to say, okay, well, I want to do more hours, right? 
or you know the advertising isn't working they'll take that kind of feedback right uh but for example if you open a franchise that allows motorcycle rentals and they tell you you need to be open eight hours a day every day monday through friday and you can't open on the weekends because we don't allow our operators to run on the weekends, right? And you, in your area, everyone isn't a local that's renting a motorcycle, but instead there are people that come up on the weekends, right? Um, you could be losing customers, and that can be a problem. So you have, to, you have to understand what your limitations are up front, and you have to understand the mechanisms for dealing with those limitations. Take a look, maybe another question. Franchisee, franchise, or relationship seems more adversarial than I thought. Yeah, well, it can be. It can be. Oh. Is that correct? Can anybody hear me? Yes? No? Maybe? Oh, that sounds right. Okay. Now, okay, back but, but in the tunnel. Okay, is that better now? You know, they... From a kilometer away. Well, I... And probably way more than a kilometer away. So even a kilometer is an improvement. Okay, fixed. Okay, perfect. Yeah, because they, you know, they color code the, the microphone wire and the headphone wire, but then they don't color code where you're putting them in. So it, it defeats the purpose. If one thing is color coded, you might as well have just colored it any color you wanted. Okay, so you're right in that it's adversarial in the sense that if you are looking for a great degree of control, a franchise is not the best thing for you. However, if you are willing to give up some control or if there is a mechanism for you to dispute the control, then you can go ahead and do it. Also, I'm sorry again for dropping you, Chad. Um, so that's what's happening. So yeah, it can be very adversarial. And so, you know, if you're not, if you don't understand all of these things going into uh, a negotiation for a franchise, you might end up in a very difficult position. Okay, so sound is good? Sounds good. All right, awesome. Um, all right. So now we move on to associated costs, right? Because all of this isn't free. Associated costs of starting a franchise, right? So usually you'll have a franchise fee. Franchise fee. So this franchise fee usually covers basically their ability to onboard you, prepare all of your materials, and so on and so forth, right? Many companies, many franchisers also use it as a form of deterrent for both deterrent and enabler for economic access, right? So for example, the franchise fee, like I said before, for Baskin Robbins, is $300,000, right? Which, it doesn't necessarily cost Baskin Robbins $300,000 to give you an ice cream machine um, or, you know, to onboard you and do all that stuff, but they charge that because they want you to be able to have that much income available in order to join them, right? And they understand that it's a profitable operation and they're going to put you in, right? For Subways, on the other hand, which is everyone's favorite $5 footlong, and we'll talk about the $5 footlong, actually, but uh, for Subways, the fee is $15,000, and it used to be ten, right? So it's gone up a little bit, but the fee is only $15,000. That's the reason you saw Subways basically explode overnight, because there were so many people in the franchise business that were interested in getting in. Um, quick side note about the $5 footlong. So I'm sure many of you have heard about the $5 footlong sandwich that Subways is so famous for. And that wasn't a corporate initiative. It was not, right? Subways actually allowed their franchisees to control things like pricing to a degree and advertising to a degree, right? 
There was a formal approval process and so on and so forth, but it was relatively quick and nimble at the beginning when Subways was first starting out. And they can credit a lot of that to the $5 footlong. So the $5 footlong was actually an idea that came about from one franchiser, right? One franchisee. Um, The franchisee was advertising $5 footlongs. They saw that it was a huge success and Subways picked up on it, right? And that's another pro that we didn't really discuss is that if the organization is, is interested in the success of its franchisers, they are going to go ahead and try to make things and borrow ideas and re-spread them out, right? So it's like joining, imagine joining a conference full of people that all own the same business as you. And not the same in terms of industry, and not the same in terms of services, but literally the same business in different locations, right? That is a huge opportunity to learn from each other and to grow in that sense, right? As long as the franchisor allows you to do so. So the first thing is the franchise fee. The second thing is investment costs. Investment costs. So usually, um, you'll have to worry about your location, your equipment, all the banners, um, any kind of paving that you need to do, any kind of approvals from the city and rezoning you need to do, and all of that falls into investment costs. The third thing is royalty payments. Now, royalty payments can be fixed or percentage-based, right? So, fixed versus percentage, right? They're very rarely fixed. This is a rare occurrence, right? The majority of the time, you're going to see a percentage-based royalty fee. And this is based on your profit. So, if you're doing a certain amount of profit every year, um, they're going to take that away. Actually, it's based on sales and profits because they don't want you hiding profits in order to avoid that fee. So they know how much, if you do it in sales, they know how much it should cost, right? So basically, if you're doing $100,000 a year in, uh, so like, for example, when I, when I was like, started working way back, when I was like 15 years old, I started working at a Taco Bell, which is a fast food restaurant. We were doing over 250 grand a week, right? So some of these places can be exceptionally, exceptionally, um, exceptionally profitable. In sales, in sales, right? We, I mean, the take home was about fifty thousand for the owner of that franchise, which is still not that bad in a week. Uh, but you know, they have to invest in different costs and give pieces to royalty payments and so on and so forth. But it's usually based on a percentage, and this the percentage is actually very good be, for two reasons, right? One, McDonald's doesn't want to only be if they if they say okay, it's percentage or a hundred thousand, right? There might be some McDonald's that don't even make a hundred thousand in a month. Right? They might make a lot less, but it's still nice to have a McDonald's there because it's the only McDonald's in the area and people go to it. Right? So usually what they'll say is they'll say that there's a minimum, so you'll have to pay about 20000 because they don't want you making less than that. That means you're running the business wrong. Or a percentage, whichever is greater. Right? Whichever is greater. So that's usually what will happen. And then there's advertising costs. And advertising costs are different for different franchises. So some franchises will do it for you, like McDonald's. Others will not. Others will give you the freedom to go ahead and do it yourself, and you have to factor that in, right? So all of those costs, you're going to end up going to a bank. And that's one of the big pros that we talked about before, is when you show up at a bank and you say, hey, I need to buy this land, I need to build this store, I need to pay a franchise fee, I need to get an advertising, and I've been approved by McDonald's to do this, they're going to be much more excited than I have an idea for McDaniels and I need all those things, right? They're going to be much more lenient because for them, they consider it a lower risk, Right? They consider it a much lower risk. Okay. So, moving on to the process of selection. How do you pick a franchise? Right? How exactly do you go about picking a franchise? Right? So, the number one way... Now, the book lists all kinds of different ways, and I've heard all kinds of different ways. You go in, and you go to these pitches, and you go to these seminars, and you look in the newspaper. The thing is, every single metric that you're going to see, list of best franchises to work for or whatever, are based on metrics that you may not be interested in, right? So the most profitable franchise might not be what you're interested in if you're looking to have more control, right? And the franchise that gives you the most freedom might not be with you interested if you're looking for the most profit. So the biggest criteria for selection is straightforward and simple meet franchise owners. 
So that means go out and go to an owner-operated McDonald's and meet with the owner and say, hey, how much do you make in a year? How worthy is this? What problems have you run into? What difficulties have you had? How much are control are you given? How much freedom are you given? How often does McDonald's feel like they're pressuring you into buying something and you don't really want to or your customers don't want it, right? So that's very, very important, right? There's also ratings, which again, like I covered before, have two major issues. One is paid placement, right? So you have to know that you're getting it from a reliable source. And then two, and perhaps most importantly, is that the criteria aren't what matters to you. This is kind of similar to selecting a university, right? When you select a university, you go to the open house and they tell you how wonderful the university is and how drunk you're going to get at every party, right? And then, you know, you go to the ratings and you open the newspaper and, you know, Harvard's first and Cambridge is up there and there's a couple others, right? And then, you know, but you start looking at the criteria and it's stuff like return on investment for income and, and you know, not things that you really care about, right? Maybe you're really interested in a university that's not only good at psychology, but that teaches in a very hands-on method or in a case study method, right? So you should be looking predominantly in terms of universities and former students, but in terms of franchises, at franchise owners. Um, okay, and then finally, there are franchise consultants. Franchise consultants. Now, I've never worked with a franchise consultant, so I don't... My understanding is that you pay franchise consultant. If you have a franchise consultant that also collects the fees from the franchise that they end up selling you into, that's not a franchise consultant. That is a franchise salesman, and you should treat him as an employee of McDonald's or whatever franchise is paying them, right? So if you have a franchise consultant, which is someone that really understands the franchise business and understands all the ins and outs, and you can sit down with them and pay them, I don't know, 500 bucks, that kind of investment, it seems like a lot to pay a guy for a couple of hours of a conversation. But the reality is it's going to save you a lot of headache. It's going to save you a lot of time. And usually they'll be happy to do services and they'll be happy to set you up with all the paperwork, introduce you to bankers that they know that are very lenient on lending money to franchises and stuff like that. So they'll be well-connected in the industry, but you'll have to find a good franchise consultant. And I, I personally don't know any, but I'm sure, I'm sure that you could get a recommendation if one of the franchise owners has used it, right? You can also go ahead and ask the franchise owners about the ratings and about consultants if you really want to, right? You can say, okay, well, how true is it that McDonald's is the number one franchise to work with, right? Or how true is it that something else is happening? So... That's going to be your number one resource, and that this is applicable in general to life, is that if you're thinking about going to a school, if you're thinking about starting a job, if you're thinking about, you know, running a Twitch program, if you're thinking about doing any of these things, right, go and talk to the people already doing it, because they'll give you the best insight, and they'll very often be very honest with you, because they have no inherent stake in you creating a franchise or not, right, so they're not getting paid by anyone, and that's kind of a very good thing. Okay, now... Moving on from franchising, now that we've kind of discussed this process and, and what it looks like, buying a working business, right? So buying a working business. This is something that is often overlooked, I think, when, when it comes to entrepreneurship, just like franchising, right? But buying a working business has some distinct advantages. So let's begin with an anecdote, okay? So I saw a business that I had been to that's for sale, right? So they currently rent the location. So they rent the location for $7,000 a month, right? So for $7,000 a month, they have a good location, right? And their location is on a predominant street. It gets a lot of traffic from all over the neighborhood and people come there and it's very popular on Fridays and Saturdays because it's littered with bars and restaurants, right? And they are, uh, I believe, Colombian, no, Ecuadorian cuisine, right? It's Ecuadorian cuisine. Ecuadorian cuisine. And they're and they're really very nice inside. It's a beautiful little space. It's a tiny space, right? So if we were if we were looking to look at a floor plan, right, it looks something like this. Right? So it looks almost like a long hallway, right? Um it's got a bar over here in the corner. This is the entrance. Right? So it's got a bar over here in the corner. It's got an entrance, right? Little bartender. There's a couple of chairs and tables here, and then there's a lot more set up over here. Right? It doesn't really seat that many, maybe 20, 30 people. They don't seem to be ever doing very much volume. But that's where they are, right? But this Ecuadorian place, I went there because they have 
a reputation for having the best tasting empanadas. The best. And they're like, you know, $2.50 or $3 a piece. They're a bit expensive, but they are delicious. And they're, and they're made in this traditional way. They have this oven in the back. And it's, it's this whole thing, right? But they haven't really advertised this fact, right? So unless you're like looking on Yelp or like really digging through a great place to get empanadas, you're not going to get it, right? So we have this empanada place, right? And we have the rest of the street. So this business is for sale for, I, I, I don't know, something like 110000 I think. Right, just a business. So they still have to pay seven thousand a month. You still have to pay all your employees. But just the business itself, what they've done so far, all of the fixtures inside, everything is about one hundred and ten thousand. Right. So I got on the phone with a friend of mine, and I said, "Okay, well, look, this place has, you know, it, actually the door I believe is in the corner. So uh, the door looks something like this. Right. So the door's right there. People are able to open it and come in, and so on and so forth. I was like, this business is for sale, right? And everything over here is bars." Literally everything. Every single thing is bars, fast food places, places to eat, more bars. I mean, this is technically a bar, right? Everything is a bar. People love going out at night over here, right? And I called them up and I said, hey, okay, well, this, this small business is for sale. What do you think? Because we had eaten there together and he's been my business partner for a lot of my ventures. And he said, okay, that seems pretty interesting. And we started discussing, okay, why do you think it's for sale? So, you know, it could be that the owner's sick. It could be that they want to get out of business. It could be that they're just in the business of starting up these companies and then selling them. You know, maybe they invested 50000 and they want to get a $60,000 profit. But the reality is not many people are willing to sell a very profitable business for very cheap. So we figured probably the problem is, is they're not too profitable, right? Well, you've never seen it very busy. Even when we were in there on a Saturday night, it wasn't that busy. Um, compared to the rest of the traffic that goes on and what you could capture. And I said, okay, so if we buy this business, how could we make it profitable, right? And the idea immediately came to him, and it didn't come to me. That's a great idea. He said, it's very easy. You set up a little window over here, and you sell empanadas to all the drunk people outside, right? All the drunk people. I don't actually know how to draw drunk people, but drunk people. There's lots of drunk people walking around, and you sell them empanadas, two, three dollars a piece, right? And you're moving them like hotcakes, because there's nothing like that. There's nothing like that available. There's not really street vendors on that street. There's little bars and stuff where you can eat, and you can, a lot of them are established restaurants. But the reality is, maybe people are coming outside, grabbing a few empanadas, and getting on the train or going home. So, people walked around, and people would get this, right? So that's that's an idea of buying a small business. So as you can see. My friend and I had no expertise when it came to get, making empanadas. We had no expertise when it came to buying chefs. We had no expertise in any other part of the business. However, we could potentially have been successful with this business if we bought it for 110000 put down another ten or 15000 to get the rights to put down a little window there, and then started selling empanadas right out of the window. Because if we could sell empanadas right out of the window, and if that made enough profit, this business might be actually profitable. So that's one of the advantages of buying a working business is that you're not starting from scratch. You're not starting from nothing and you get to use up a lot of the expertise that you don't have and then apply the ones that you do, which are usually later in the business cycle. So, man, this is not a safe wire situation. I got to figure out this wire situation a little better. Okay. Um. All right, so why buy an existing business? Why do it? Why would you do it, right? One, you reduce uncertainty. There's always a price tag for this, but some people are willing to pay the price. The less uncertain something is, the better it is because you already know how it's operating. You already know how many people walk in and out, right? You already know how it works. Um, you also have established relationships, so you already have some customers that come in all the time. You already have some uh, suppliers for your dough in this case and your meat and so on and so forth that you are also easing into that you don't have to go out and build, right? Three, you save money, right? So the reality is, unless this is your 25th restaurant, you're going to make mistakes. And if you make mistakes, they're going to cost you. And they're usually going to cost you a lot. Right? If you buy an established business, they already have all the rights and permits and permissions and everything else that you need. So this is done. 
So you save money. And four, you start faster. This is a huge thing, right? This is actually extremely, extremely important. Right? Because the thing is, once you've invested the 110000 that business is already operating. And even if it's operating mostly on a loss, it's better to be operating mostly on a loss than not operating at all. Because if you're not operating at all, then you're operating at 100% loss. Right? So no matter where you buy the business, you're better off if it's already operating than if it's not. The downside is you don't have much flexibility. right? So there's no way that I could buy that empanada place and then turn it into a disco. Right? I mean, they could, but then there's no point in buying it. I could just buy an empty space and, and start a disco from scratch. Okay, um, So, what are the important things? So, what's important to figure out before buying a business is why they're selling. Now, let's be completely frank. The book recommends asking the owner. That is terrible fucking advice. Okay? That is terrible advice because they're never going to tell you why unless it's actually a very good legitimate reason, right? So, I actually looked into buying a kindergarten for about $2.5 million uh, that was for sale. And the reason the person was selling it was she was the director of the kindergarten. She had done kindergartening and preschool and daycare for about 40 years. Um, and she decided that... It was time to retire. She didn't really have any heirs. So she wanted to sell the business and retire and, and you know, have a, have a nice life and not worry about it, right? Now, this, this was a pretty good price because it was based in a very large home. So if you can imagine, this is like a two-level home. Uh, the bottom was the pre-K, right? And then the top was where, where they were living and it had a big yard and everything else. And it was pretty centrally located. Um... So you want to know why they're selling, right? So in that case, I asked her why she was selling. She said it was because she was retiring. And I believed her because she looked like a trustable and respectable person. Um, however, most of the time, you're going to get owners that cook the books. That hide cash and keep it off the books so that they don't have to pay taxes, etc., etc. So the best way to figure out if you're going to buy a business is the following. No owner is going to shut down their business and then put it up for sale. They're going to keep running it for the same reason that we talked about before, which is if they're running the business, it's better than taking a 100% loss while it's for sale, right? So what do you do? You go to the stores, you go to the business, and you spend some time there. You spend some time there and you see how many customers walked by, how many customers walked in, how many customers got something that they looked for? How many customers walked out with big bags? How many customers walked out with no bags? How many customers sat down and ate there throughout the day? Was it busier on Saturdays and Sundays? And stuff like that. So you have to investigate on your own, right? That's probably the most important thing is you go out and you investigate on your own. Investigate yourself, right? If the business is far away or you're unable to get there, you can send a business partner or a friend to go take a look, but it's always best to go investigate on your own. What do you mean by cooking the books? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, shoot, I almost did it again. Okay, can you guys hear me? Okay, I almost dropped everyone again. Okay, so let's let's take a look at cooking the books. Cooking the books. So let's say you walk into a restaurant and you say, hey, I'm really interested in buying your restaurant. Let's say it's this empanada place, right? I'm really interested in buying this empanada place. Could you show me what you made in the last 12 months? Right? They've actually only been in operation for about 12 months. So you come to them and you say, what have you made in the last 12 months? Right? And he takes out this book, right? And it says that he made $150,000 in profit in the first month. Right, or let's say fifteen thousand dollars in profit, let's scale down the numbers, right? And then ten thousand in profit, and then eight thousand in profit, right, and so on and so forth. Now you have no way of verifying that this is his actual book, right? You could say, Okay, well, give me your tax returns. All right. So they could give you the tax returns and you could verify this, right? You could verify that this is their profit. Right? You could verify this is how much they're making. But what ends up happening, and the major problem with that is that they might be in the business of founding businesses, faking the books, paying a small amount of taxes. So let's say, for example, let's take it from the perspective of the owner. Let's say they invested 100000 into the business, right? Let's say their business just broke even. It didn't actually make a profit. It broke even, right? So they've lost no money since then for 12 months. They haven't gained any, but they haven't lost any. Then they go to the IRS and they say, hey, actually, uh, we made 100000 this year. 
a loan, right? And the IRS says, well, no problem. You owe us 30% taxes, okay? So they end up spending 100000 to found the business and 30000 on the taxes, bringing their total cost to 130 k okay? Now, if you were to do a valuation on this business, and we'll talk about valuations, you would say, well, if this business is bringing in 100000 a year and I'm okay with recouping my costs over the next three years, right, I'd be willing to pay somewhere in the region of two hundred to 300000 for this business, right? So if you walked in and you believed what was on the books and you paid two hundred or 300000 you would be in for a nasty surprise. And there's no repercussion for you from the owner because the owner faked the books or cooked the books all together, right? So they doctored the books, they altered the books, whatever it is, in order to show that they were more profitable than they were so that they could sell the business, right? And a lot of owners will do this because of the way people traditionally value a business. And that's why it's so important to think about how you value a business and where you... I keep losing my eraser. How you value a business. I think I'm going to like tie it with a string to the board. I think that's my next, my next step. So I hope that answers your questions on cooking the books. Basically, cooking the books is just alternating the values in your accounting to show that you were more profitable than you actually were. Okay, so how do you find a business to buy? There's three methods. Now, there used to be two methods, but basically, you look online. Right, stuff like LoopNet. Uh, there's a couple others that'll advertise usually the commercial real estate section. Um, you look in the newspaper. Newspapers will advertise it as well. But probably the most successful way and the way you're going to get the best deals and the best opportunities is keeping your ear on the ground. Ear on the ground. And what that means is you go into different shops. Every time you shop around, you try to talk to the owners of the business. You say, hey, how's business going? What are you doing? What are you up to? Um, you know, what are you thinking? You know, if you heard from anybody that they're selling their business, is anybody interested in doing so? I'd be interested in buying it, right? So you keep your ear on the ground. And a lot of the times people will prefer to sell their business because a business is like a legacy, right? A business is like a legacy. Even if you own a 99 cent store, right? That's your 99 cent store. It's your baby. You've built it, right? And so when you're selling it, there's a legacy attached to it. So the person you sell it to, you want them to be familiar, right? You want them to be familiar. You want them to share values with you. You don't want someone that's going to come in and disappoint and ruin all your customers' days and, and just be terrible. You want someone that's going to represent something similar to what you represented. And so by keeping your ear on the ground and establishing these relationships, you're going to get much better deals because they pay a fee, right? When you think about it, when I'm pricing a business, if I'm pricing it to someone I trust and understand is going to carry on the business the same way, I'm more likely to give them a better price than if I think someone is going to just come in, slash costs, ruin all my customer relationships, ruin all my supplier relationships, and generally just make me look bad. Um, even if I'm no longer involved in the business, still a lot of those people that you work with, your suppliers, your customers, a lot of them are your friends, right? A lot of them become your friends over time and, or acquaintances, you might call them, right? Isn't that an IRS fraud? Yeah, sure. It sure is, but how do you prove it, right? The thing is, it's fraud, but how do you prove that fraud? Right? There's no way for you to prove that fraud because right? There's actually it's actually very easy fraud to cover up because then what do you do? You just pay the owner some exorbitant amount of money, right? Or you say that you charge for empanadas different than what you actually charged, or you run two for one deals and then never report them. Um the thing is the IRS is never gonna chase you down about paying more taxes, right? They're not. They're not gonna show up at your door and be like, You paid more taxes then I think we then then we think you actually made so this is a problem we're not going to trust you anymore but it is fraud it is fraud on a large scale and if you do it on a large enough scale it's very dangerous but unless you're a public company or you have some enforced disclosure or auditing required by third parties there's no problem there's absolutely no problem there right you, there's no way there's no way for you to get caught realistically unless unless the person that tries to buy your business is extremely experienced in that business right so someone that can look at the books show i mean there are people like this right there are people like this that have just been in retailing they've been in um restaurants they've been in whatever for so long that they can like walk around a neighborhood get a feel for the foot traffic and they can tell you you know 
plus or minus a couple thousand dollars how much you make in a month with your current advertising and everything else, right? And those people will catch you on a lie, but those people have no incentive to go and report you to the IRS. It's just not worth it. They just won't buy your business. So scams like that happen all the time. Scams like that happen all the time. Um, and there's really not much you can do about it except your due diligence, which is extremely important. So how do you value a business? Valuation of a business. How do you value a business? So there's a couple of different ways that you value a business, right? The first is an asset-based valuation. Asset-based valuation. And this simply means if I walk into the restaurant, if I was to take everything out of the restaurant and sell it, how much money would I make, right? Um, so how much money would I make if I took everything out of the restaurant, basically just sold it, scrap metal, third party, liquidation, whatever, just sold everything, what's it worth, right? That's asset-based valuation. That makes sense for business that are capital intensive. So for example, if you're buying a factory, um, you might want to do an asset valuation because you want to know how much you can get out of that factory in a worst case scenario. Or if the business is liquidating and going into bankruptcy and you're trying to buy it, you might want to do that too to say, okay, well, worst case scenario, if I can't rescue the business, how much can I make for selling all this stuff, right? The second is market comparables. Now, this is often misleading and difficult to do, but it's still done. So, for example, let's say we're talking about that empanada restaurant, right? Um, and you look at the empanada restaurant and you look at all the restaurants around the, the, the street and you say, okay, well, what works, what doesn't? Um, how much are these other restaurants making? And you say, okay, well, you know, this other restaurant next door is making 50000 a month, right? But they have 100 chairs and 50 tables, and we only have 20 chairs and 10 tables, right? So we should expect to make about 10000 per month. That's difficult to say because really what you're comparing is apples to oranges. I mean, you know, this, this, this empanada place doesn't even deliver, Right, so uh, they're not on Grubhub, they're not on any of those kind of delivery services, right? So they're not really cashing in on a lot of the stuff that they should be cashing in on. Um, so it's difficult to say. It's difficult to say what's correct, and it's difficult also to find reliable, comparable information. Because, you know, I mean, a privately owned restaurant isn't usually going to say, okay, yeah, sure, look at my books. You're looking to compete with me. That's no problem. Just take a look at how much I spend and what I do. and. You'll have no problem doing that. So this is usually done for very, very, very large businesses um, or very specific niches or franchises. You could actually do this for a McDonald's, right? If you wanted to buy someone else's McDonald's that they had as a franchise and become a new franchise just using all of their equipment, you could do a market comparable and figure out how much you should make in that McDonald's. The third method of valuation is cash flow based. Cash flow. This is by far my favorite method of valuation, but the one more likely to get you deceived because you have to look at the cash flows, right? So how much money is the company making and how long will it take me to recoup the cost? So like I said, in general, for different businesses, the recoup cost is different. So for example, the survival rate for a restaurant on average is about three years, right? So if you're going to buy a restaurant after it's been in operation for two and a half years and not making money, you're taking a huge risk, right? But if they get past that three years, it's about a 10-year hump right? So let's say you buy it at the third year, it's doing really well, you think it's going to go on for the 10 years. You look at the cash flow, and they're making about $100,000 a year, right? So you sit down with the owner, and you say, look, I'll pay you the next two years of cash flow up front, 200 grand for this business. And in exchange, I'll collect in three years, the first 100,000 and the remaining money, right? This also applies to if the business is growing. So if they went to 50, to 100, to 150, and you're buying it here, the owner may demand that you pay them 200 and 250 for the next two years instead, right? Because the business is growing, which is why sometimes businesses exit. So what will happen is we're going back to that, to that idea of asymmetric information. So for example, let's say you are a very talented on, uh, entrepreneur and you're a restaurateur. Right? So you open these Ecuadorian empanada places. And you open the Ecuadorian empanada places all the time, and you know 
you know for a fact that growth starts slowing down after the third year, and that's it. So when are you going to try to sell? You're going to sell right at the third year, right at that incline, so that you can claim that it's going to keep going up. Because, I mean, really, you don't know that beyond beyond you know a shadow of a doubt. You don't know that it's going to keep going down. That's just what your instincts and your experience tell you, right? But you can tell someone, no, 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 it'll keep increasing in price. So what you should pay me, so for example, if this is the price, or if this is the value, sorry, the cash flow of the company, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven years, right? Let's say this is the predicted. So we're right here right now, right? And let's say this is predicted. You can say, okay, well, pay me this, which is the area under this shaded region right and then you can earn this and everything else going forward right now that could be the way you pitch it to someone that you're selling it to but the reality is the future might look something like this right and then that area under the graph that you've just paid that's right if we take this triangle and just put it over here that's like the next five years of profit and then you shut down and you don't even break even you just lose money right so it's a tricky way to do valuations um but if you can if you can sit down in a restaurant or in a business and do just some basic back of the napkin math you'll figure it out very quickly you'll figure it out very quickly you have to make a bunch of assumptions but if you sit down and you order a couple of empanadas and you sit there or you know you sit across the street at a restaurant and you see okay well about 30 people walked in most of them dined for about half an hour right um some of them dined for about one hour Right, so the people that dined for one hour probably ate more. Most parties were parties of two. There were no parties of six, so they're probably not getting very big orders, usually just small orders, and usually around lunchtime or happy hour when they run happy hour. So these are the prices on the menu. I think they're probably doing like a 40% markup. What are they making in a day? And then you take that day and you say, okay, well, what does that look like in a year? How, how off can I be? I can be off by about 20 or 30%. This is what I think cash flows look like. Right, so <clears throat> that's the way to estimate cash flow. Then you have market potential. This is the most dubious way of pricing startups, right? Startups will come to you and they say, the demand for Ecuadorian food in America is rising. Everyone loves Ecuadorian food. As a matter of fact, the closest nation to Ecuador in terms of cuisine is Guatemala. And Guatemalan food between 2000 and 2008 grew by more than 400%. We think we're in a similar situation for Ecuadorian food. And we've only grown 10% so far. So this is right at the beginning. So we expect that we'll grow by 400% in the next five years. And so you should give our business $2 million. This is bullshit. It's all total bullshit. If anybody ever comes to you with this kind of market potential valuation, tell them to never, ever, ever pitch an idea to you again. Ever. Ever. Fuck that. That is a total nonsensical thing. You don't know how many customers you're going to get. You don't know how much beef prices are going to change. And as a matter of fact, the only thing that this tells you, when somebody comes to you with a valuation like this, the only thing that it tells you is that they haven't even thought about the risks. Right? They haven't even thought about the risks. Right? So let's talk about a simple empanada business. Right? Beef prices. Lease termination. Rent. Catastrophe, like food poisoning. Economic downturn. Wage increases. Key employees. So if you have one chef that's like a master of making empanadas and he tells you I want to make a hundred grand a year, what are you gonna do? Kick him out? How the hell are you gonna make fucking empanadas? Right? They haven't even thought about all these risks. All they've thought about is, well, the world seems to be growing at a certain pace, so we'll just grow with them. That's that's fucking bullshit. Right? That's never happened in the history of ever. Right? That's literally never happened in the history of ever. No company has ever come out with a statement like this and then gone on to actually have that happen because it's not how reality works. It's not how reality works. So if somebody is pitching you market potential, put it in the garbage. Take it, shove it in the garbage, set it on fire, and then throw it at them. 
while it's on fire, okay? Just never, never, ever. If you ever have a startup idea, never, ever pitch it like this because it doesn't make sense. This tells me nothing. This tells me nothing except your ability to find the most the biggest percentage, the biggest increase, the biggest opportunity that you can find while Googling around on the internet, right? This is all that that tells me. If you come to me with this, with a startup idea, and you tell me, look, I don't know how much we're going to make, but I know that we can account for beef prices. I know that we've signed a contract with our employees that, that keep wage increases constant for five years. I know that we can renew the lease for up to 30 more years if we decide to do so at the following increases. I know that our rent can't be raised more than 2% a year. I know that we have stringent procedures for, gener for working with catastrophes like E. coli poisoning and stuff like that. I know that during an economic downturn, we are flexible enough to be able to reduce our prices by 50% in order to bring in people. And I know for a fact that our key employee, our chef, is going to stay with the business because they own 30% of the business. If you come to me with this, I'm willing to invest in whatever the fuck you want. I don't care if you're making batteries or empanadas or shoelaces. It doesn't matter because here you've seen that someone has thought about the business and thought about all of the things that can go wrong, right? Not all the things that can go right. Everyone can think of all the things that can go right. Yeah, if everything went right, you would just win the lottery and then the business would become super successful, okay? Why don't, you, why don't people tell us that? Why don't people tell us, hey, you know, I'm starting an empanada business and our business plan, so, you know, lottery winnings have been growing by about 30% and they've been moving geographically from west to east. Uh, and so, basically, we expect that the lottery percentage win for New York is getting pretty high. So, our business plan is to make empanadas and then invest our money into lottery tickets and hope that we make a killing, right? That's bullshit. That's bull Even that's better than, than freaking, you know, that other explanation I gave. So, whatever. That's my rant. That's my rant. Don't, don't bother with businesses like that, ever. Okay. Um, all right. Non-quantitative factors. Back to evaluating a business. So if you can, do it by cash flow, right? So here's, here's the thing, right? Market comparables. This is your peak. This is the maximum that they're going to make, okay? If you've got an established restaurant for 50 years down the block that's making a certain amount of money and you can generally judge how much money that is and then you can divide it up and, and you know, form that to your own and you count deliveries and stuff like that, this is the peak of what they're doing. Okay, they're not, they're not going to surpass that. If they do, it'll be a miracle. And, you know, God bless it if it happens. But the reality is don't count on it ever getting any higher than that. And count that as your best, 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 best case scenario. Okay, your asset base valuation is your bottom. That is the most that you are going to lose. So basically, in the situation where you buy the business and it goes bankrupt tomorrow, right, this is what you're going to get. That's it. So if you buy the business for 100,000 and there's 50,000 worth of stuff in it and you sell it for 40,000, you'll lose 60 grand, right? That's it. That's what you should know. And this is your middle of the line. This is your middle of the line. And that's why it's okay if this is an estimate, right? This is your middle of the line. Okay, so that's the way you should be comparing it. That at last astronomical whatever valuation that a lot of companies decide to do is total garbage. Just absolute total fucking garbage. Okay. Non-quantitative factors. Jesus Christ. Okay. Non-quantitative factors. Okay. So, we have the following. One, competition. Okay. If you're founding the fifth Ecuadorian place on the block, you're probably in trouble. The market. Are people even in the, on the market for buying empanadas, right? Future community development. This is pretty important, okay? So if you're in a community, if you're in a community, so for example, uh, that kindergarten that I was talking about um, has the following kind of location attributes, right? So I'm, I'm always looking for, for new businesses and business opportunities just because I'm always curious about what's going on in the world, right? So like this, like this, like this, okay. So this is this little two-story house here that's a pre-K, okay. It's currently a pre-K and they're looking to sell. This 
is this eight brand new 18 story building this is a brand new 12 story building this is a brand new eight story building this is a brand new nine story building okay that's amazing these aren't even occupied and this place has enough customers there's not even people living in them yet and th can you imagine if there's like five or six apartments per floor and there's probably more but can you imagine if there's five or six we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of families that are about to move to within across the street of this pre-k right that is massive absolutely massive and absolutely huge so if you were going to open up an empanada place and you know that your community is growing and that everything is expanding and more people are coming in you should factor that in to what you think about okay next legal commitments and union contracts legal commitments and union contracts on the whole just try not to buy businesses that already come with baggage okay you're going to figure out and make enough problems that you're going to attract enough baggage on your own. Don't add more baggage on top of things, okay? And then finally, your product prices, okay? Prices. So if you're selling empanadas for 2 or $3 and people are buying them, that's great. If you're selling empanadas for one fifty and nobody can afford them, that's not a good business style right which means you're going to need to lower prices so don't take the prices that they post for granted see if people are actually buying something and see if you're actually achieving some economies of scale because if you're only selling three empanadas that means you're throwing away a shit ton of beef every single time okay finally i want to talk about one thing that, that, that got brought up in the discord that i'm in uh and that i was asked about and that's dilution okay so let's say you want to buy a working business but let's say you can't afford to buy the whole thing so you decide to buy into a working business right so, for example, dilution works something like this. So, let's say this is a business owner, okay? And we're going to give him a top hat, all right? So, he's got a top hat because he's a business owner. He's got a little uh, bag of money, like that, right? And he says, you know, I'm looking for a business partner in my business, not because I need the cash or anything else, uh, but simply because... Well, there could be a litany of reasons. First of all, he could be looking for a brand new all-star chef. He could be looking for a manager that has buy-in, right? So he's moving out of the country. He wants someone that buys into his business. He still wants to collect money from it. So he's willing to sell 50% of his business. And that's that. Okay. So right now, this man owns 100 shares of the business, right? Most businesses are corporations. And so he owns 100 shares of the business. Here's his smiley face. Okay. So he owns 100 shares of the corporation. Now, if he sells you half the business, right? So let's say you come along, right? And here you are and you're wearing a dress, right? And you come along and you decide to buy the business, right? And, you know, let's say you've got a nice little, nice little loan from the bank, right? Loan for the bank, right? And you say, I want to buy half the business, all right? So the way dilution works is he's never actually going to sell you 50 shares, Right, he's not going to sell you 50 shares. Instead, what he's going to do is he's going to issue a hundred new shares. Okay, so instead, now the pie has grown larger. So each of you own a hundred shares, which is only 50%. Okay, that's only 50%, right? And that's all you're going to get as a piece of that business now let's say that you and him agree on certain things and this is something you should agree on who controls how the business operates i mean he's overseas right so you should probably be in control right so maybe you agree that your shares have the control and his don't right okay but what if you decide to sell the business can you only sell your half can you sell pieces of your half to other people right? Can he sell pieces of his half? So that issue of control is very important when it comes to dilution, right? So let's say you're doing very well, right? And you're looking to open a second location and you want to keep the business the same. And you talk to him and he's like, yeah, sure. Open a second location. How are you going to do that? Okay. So what you're going to do is you're going to get a bank or another person to invest into your company, right? You're going to say, okay, we're not giving them any control, right? But this guy in, in uh, he's like very square shouldered. Okay. Very square shouldered. And he's got a briefcase. All right, so he's got a briefcase. He's very square-shouldered. All he does is carry around money in his briefcase, right? And he decides he's going to invest 
a large sum of money because that's what you need to open a new, another piece of the business, right? So you decide to give him 500 shares, which means for every dollar that this company makes right now, he gets it, okay? For every dollar that this company makes, he gets 50 cents and she gets 50 cents. Now, if he gets 500 shares, you're going to issue a new 500 shares, right? So you're going to have two slivers of the pie like this, which are going to be 100 and 100. And this piece is going to be 500, right? Actually, for the ease of math, let's, let's make it 300, okay? So we're going to make it 300 shares, right? And what that means is for every dollar now, one person is going to get 20 cents. This person is going to get 20 cents. And he is going to collect 60 cents. Right? So the pie has gotten bigger as the ownership has expanded. Right? And that's what's important about buying a working business. So when you dilute what's happening, right? When you when you have dilution, you also always importantly have issues of control and issues of earnings. Now here's the bad side of dilution or the good side of dilution, everyone owns a piece, right? So here's the thing. If you own a piece of this $1, right, presumably when you sold it to this other person, it's still $1. When you sold it to him and opened up a second store, right, maybe now you're all splitting $10, okay? So now he's receiving $2, which is more than he was receiving on his own. She's receiving $2, which is four times as much as she was receiving as part of the business. And he's receiving $6, right, which is fair for his investment. Okay, so splitting a larger pie amongst more people is okay as long as the pie is growing, right? However, you have to worry about control, you have to worry about earnings. Because if she can just decide to sell more shares or give away shares to a venture capital firm or some other investment company, you're going to run into a lot of problems where your dilution could become so small and insignificant without the company actually growing fast enough to support it. So that's dilution. This is a guy with money. This is a lady with a loan. And this is a man with a briefcase. And now we can do questions. Oh. Okay. Oh, what did you guys think of the lecture? Today. Was it a good lecture? Shit, I keep losing my power for some reason on my laptop. Okay. All right. So that's where we're at. That was the lecture. Uh, okay, so somewhat unrelated, but how do I. Okay. Thank you so much for saying good lecture. Always. Always know uh, that unrelated questions are the best types of questions because they take us on new tangents and we can explore new things together. So somewhat unrelated, but how do businesses quantify how worth it is to have a loss leader product? Um, the same way businesses quantify marketing costs. That's it. Uh, basically, your loss leader product is going to have one of two benefits, right? So, so okay, let's try to think about, um, loss leader products are actually pretty interesting. So let's try to think about what happens with loss leader products. So a loss leader product will have a couple of different, a couple of different things, right? Loss leader. So it could be advertising. So it could be that you release a product that takes a huge loss, but you sell some complementary product that then makes you the gain, all right? So this is effectively advertising. It's like putting up a billboard. The billboard doesn't make you any money. It loses you money, but the billboard might sell more of some other product, right? So you could capitalize it as advertising. Um, another way you could have a loss leader product is through forcing economies of scale. Uh, and this is actually more common than people think, but basically economies of scale. 
So forcing economies of scale, and another way you can have a loss leader product is uh, through market testing. Market testing. Market testing, and then uh, business strategy. So we'll cover each one, right? So for advertising, basically, you release a product that, um, okay, you release a product like photo cameras or printers. There you go. Oh, my head's cut off and the lecture's cut off. Sorry about that. Um, you release a product like printers, okay? And then you charge for the ink. You release a product like razor blade handles, and then you charge for the razor blades, right? So in a way, it's a form of advertising because if the razor blade is very cheap, people are going to buy the razor blade and then keep buying the razors. Same with the printer. They're going to buy the printer and then keep buying the ink cartridges, right? So you make the money on the ink cartridges, but you suck them in with that thing because people don't often like to change razors or change printers every two weeks, right? So that is a form of advertising, right? So you're using it to sell another product. And the way you justify that is, okay, what if we only sold printers and ink and we spent that much money on advertising? Would it produce the same results? Probably not, right? I haven't really seen many Canon, Canon printer ads, but the reality is I've never looked at an ad and desperately wanted to buy a printer, right? Um, and we'll talk about advertising hopefully in another course. There's a lot of very interesting things in advertising to cover, but um, that's advertising. You can also force economies of scale. So that's the following. Um, let's say... Uh, let's say you are a shoe manufacturer, okay, and you have a shoe that doesn't really sell very well, but it doesn't suffer from seasonality, and it doesn't suffer from fashion. Uh, so, for example, it's just a staple shoe. It's just... It just is what it is, and you just keep making it, and people just buy it as is. Uh, Converse are like that, okay? So Converse are like that. People kind of buy Converse year-round. They don't really suffer from fashion. They kind of just always look like Converse, right? Um, so what you do is, let's say you set up a plant, right? And that plant has a certain capacity, but let's say you're only at about one-third or two-thirds of capacity, right? And you know that at two-thirds of capacity, every single shoe you produce costs you $1.50. But when you're at full capacity, every shoe you produce costs you $0.25. Cents. Now, the savings aren't often as drastic, but you can see how even if you're producing Converse and they're just sitting in a warehouse somewhere or just sitting on the shelf or being sold overseas at ridiculously low prices, it's still worth it because you're saving so much money on your other products, right? So that's another way a loss leader can be positive. Um, the third way is market testing. So a lot of companies do this. It doesn't necessarily have to be a loss leader, but a lot of times companies will simply take a new product. Uh, I forget what state it is in the United States that's famous for market testing, but there is a state in a specific city where every single fast food chain releases, you know, barbecue ribs and all this crazy stuff that they're trying to figure out if it works to those people first, and they see if those people buy it. Um, and so that's market testing, and that's pretty interesting. You're often not going to find a loss leader unless it's enabling you to market test. Okay, so unless you have a product that enables you to market test effectively, um, or if you're going to be taking a loss on it and earning money from advertising, for example, right? So if you're taking a big loss on this, this object, but then you're making up the money somewhere else, that's also good. But this is a much rarer example. And then finally, there's business strategy. So a lot of times companies will follow the old Coca-Cola model, which is Coca-Cola re release new Coke. Right. And people fucking hated New Coke. They hated New Coke. Absolutely hated it. Everybody hated New Coke. It was nothing like old Coke. They hated New Coke. Right? Just hated it. And then guess what? They brought back Coke. Oh shit. Smart company, right? Except you know it was different? It wasn't made with sugar. It was made with corn syrup. And no one batted an eye. They were so happy to get Coke back. They had no idea that it had changed. So business strategy is another way where it's often important to produce products that lose money in order to fool consumers into thinking what you're doing is different. 
Um, so that's that. And we'll hopefully cover stuff like that in the business strategy course. There's a lot of that in business that I think a lot of people aren't aware of. So that's lost leaders. I hope I answered your question. So how do you determine it? It's just whether or not you're losing more on it, or whether or not you could make it differently, right? If you could generate the same results by putting up posters, that's probably a better idea. But if that's generating the best results, then it's generating the best results. Yeah, of course.